It's getting crazier and crazier how people are using old tech to solve some big new tech problems. And one of this is like with Bitcoin. So recently a popular YouTuber, he um, made a way to mine Bitcoin with a very old Game Boy. Does it very, very slowly. But this was a really cool story I saw. And essentially what he did is it required three different things. He used a Game Boy console um, and a slightly modified link cable, a Raspberry Pi, and a regular computer. So those are the only three things he used and using it, something that was invented and came out before, like came out 20 years before Bitcoin was ever invented, he was able to actually mine Bitcoin. Meanwhile, it, it didn't really do a great job, but that being said, he still is able to do it. So the problem with this is that essentially the Game Boy came out 20 years before Bitcoin was ever even thought of, ever invented. And so it's not very, it doesn't have a lot of processing power. It can't handle the same sort of, it can't handle what computers today can do and especially can't handle those massive computers you see mining Bitcoin. Now people have like warehouses where they just, mine bitcoin and it's just full of computers and that's all that whole entire building is dedicated to mining bitcoin so a small little game boy from from you know years ago can't do much so, but what it can do is right now they the how fast it runs is essentially it runs at 0.8 hashes per second um, and that compares to today the supercomputers the the fast computers used to mine bitcoin they're about 125 trillion times faster than the Game Boy. So they do about 100 terahashes per second. So 0.8 hashes versus 100 terahashes per second. So it's really unlikely that he could just sit and mine Bitcoin and make money doing this. But when they set it up with a new Bitcoin blockchain with no records on it, um, it was actually able to successfully mine blocks um so people are talking about something called game coin or you know maybe making a new coin altogether that could that this could mine but this was pretty interesting um it is by far going to be like the slowest way to mine bitcoin ever and it's not really you can't really be profitable doing it or make money but it was really cool how they were able to use something so old like a old technology something invented way before bitcoin that still works and they were able to use that to actually mine Bitcoin just with a couple AA batteries. So I found that pretty interesting. It's crazy to see what people can use old technology for to use on new technology problems today. Next up is Canoe. So Canoe is an electric vehicle company and they have some proprietary technology. It's called a skateboard where essentially they put the vehicles on this rolling skateboard and that's how they're built. And right now Canoe's deal with Hyundai, uh, Hyundai apparently is completely dead. No longer going to be a thing. Um, recently Canoe, they are officially a publicly traded company. They went public via SPAC merger and now they had one of their first investor calls and it wasn't it wasn't the best let's just say because canoe their chairman tony tony aquila he shared the news monday that the deal with hyundai is dead that um that that's not really the way they're trying to move the company moving forward. Recently, they had unveiled their um, electric pickup truck. It looks, it looks like it's a toy out of a movie, their electric pickup truck. They also have uh, a van, a delivery van. And um, they said, instead of working on these partnerships and things like that, they said right now their goal and what they're gonna do instead is work on actually selling their vehicles um, directly to consumers or on some commercial opportunities. They say they're not going to be pursuing any partnerships at this time. Um, it's much safer for the business to just work on building their own vehicles and like their electric pickup truck, their delivery van. They said, and work on selling those because there's been a lot of demand for them and people are excited about this new pickup truck that they've had and they want to get these out to people. They want to work on that. And if there are partnerships later on, then it'll be less risk. They can worry about that later. But this investor call really wasn't great because it, it doesn't seem like the partnerships that they had just, 
it doesn't seem like they just decided to step away from them. It seems like these other companies, like um, they decided they no longer wanted to work with Canoe. And this deal was first announced in February of 2020. And it was supposed to be that both Hyundai and Kia brands would build vehicles on Canoe's electric vehicle platform. Canoe had said in their investors presentation that really they were trying to work on you know, selling their technology, licensing out their technology and using their engineering services line to really build up the brand. But now they're saying that's not the case. They want to focus rather than on, you know, selling tech like their technologies and utilizing their engineering services. What they want to do instead is they essentially just want to work on selling their vehicles directly to consumers and commercial, you know, vehicles. Some other things that happened in this investors conference were that their CEO was absent from the call. The company announced earlier in the day also that their CFO had resigned. And that was like the second major departure from the company in recent weeks. They lost their head of corporate strategy. Now they lost their CFO. Their CEO was absent from the investor call. Their founder or one of their co-founders had has left the company within the last couple of months. So things aren't looking great. You know, it's not a good sign when you're seeing all of the C-level executives, these high-level people in a company leaving. But good news is, is they do have that electric pickup truck that looks really, really interesting. They've had a lot of demand for it so far. It's supposed to be launching, you know, within the next couple of years. So that will be good. But um at least they have the money from the SPAC merger. They have about $600 million, but it's not a good sign when you're seeing partnerships fall through, you're seeing C-level executives leave the company, the CFO resign, and the CEO not even present during uh, the first investor's call. So something to keep an eye out on moving forward. Speaking of technology though, Boston Dynamics, you know, the, the company that we're always seeing these robot videos, they have the robot um, called Spot which is a dog, and um, that's the most popular one that everyone knows about. You know, it's that yellow robot that you see walking around. Um, people can actually buy it, but now they just showed off their new, a new robot, Spot's cousin, <laughs> called Stretch, which is a tentacled warehouse robot used for, um, it's going to be used for moving boxes, um, hard, to, hard to maneuver like actions that normally people would have to do themselves. Well, now they can have this robot which can do it. And essentially, um, this is their newest robot. It's it's gonna be designed specifically for commercial purposes. And it's their first commercial robot specifically designed for warehouse facilities and distribution centers. They're trying to just make it you know, more efficient, easier for, for boxes to be moved around within a factory. And essentially they have a technology, they call it Stretch's Smart Gripper which has just a bunch of suction cups on the end of the the arm for this robot. It has a lot of suction cups. And what it does is it uses these suction cups, it, it uses these suction cups to just pick up boxes or it could pick up even, you could see spot robot could be picked up with these suction cups. So really it seems like the way it works is anything that has somewhat of a flat surface, as long as it's not rugged, as long as it can suction onto it, it can pick that up, place it down carefully, and that is what they're currently working on. Um, it's small enough that it can be, it's, a very, it's very practical, it's small enough that it could fit anywhere that a pallet does. So anywhere where there's a pallet of boxes, if, if a pallet can fit there, this robot can fit as well. And we don't know a price tag on it yet, but they are planning to release it for commercial use by 2022. And, you know, you see a lot of manufacturing facilities already have robots. Amazon factories use, um, Amazon facilities use a lot of different technology and robots in them. But now this is completely different. It could pick up boxes um, f just any way, as long as it can suction onto one of the surface one of the surfaces of the box, it could just pick up the box and move it, whether that's from on top, whether that's from the side, doesn't matter. As long as it can suction onto a surface, then it can pick up and place back down. So I thought this was really cool. They're always coming up with really exciting robots. They have a robot that looks like a human. They have a robot that you know looks like a dog. And now they're having this robot that'll be used for commercial purposes and I think I think this will be a really big success you know we don't know how much it's going to be but I definitely think it will be a success next up is electric 
vehicles. Mercedes-Benz, they just revealed the cockpit of their Mercedes-Benz EQS, which is going to be like the S-Class version, like an electric S-Class vehicle. And this is a big deal because Lucid Motors has previously said that they're like the luxury vehicle. They are you know, the go-to, the only luxury, purely luxury electric vehicle out there. And they were talking, they were comparing themselves to like an S-Class, an S-Class Mercedes, but electric. And now Mercedes is announcing their own. And we saw the cockpit of this vehicle. And in my opinion, I think this blows Lucid Motors out of the water completely. If you're looking at the cockpit of this vehicle, it looks completely out of a movie. So what it has, essentially the white interior and the screen goes across the entire front dashboard of the vehicle. They call it a hyper screen. And the German luxury brand, Mercedes-Benz, they showed off the interior. Um, we're not going to see the full car debut until April 15th, but we have the interior, what it's going to look like, some of the specific features of it. And right, what it is, it's a 56-inch um, screen that just goes straight across the entire front dashboard of the vehicle. Um, in total, the passenger has about 2.6 feet of curved glass with different features on it. And yeah, this, you can't really, in my opinion, looking at the interior of this versus Lucid Motors versus other electric vehicles out there, this brings it to a whole new level. And what this car does is essentially um, the screen, it has a digital gauge cluster um, for the driver right ahead of them with like the speed, the um, speed, how much battery you have left, you know, the pretty standard things there. Also, the passenger gets a screen um, to fill around with uh, mirrors, um, many of the center screen functions. One thing that they're really trying to focus on with this screen is they don't want to make it that you have to navigate and scroll through multiple menus to find the necessary Um, the necessary buttons that you would normally use. So, for example, air conditioning or, you know, changing the temperature in the car. They want to make sure all these buttons are very easy to access so you don't have to scroll through all the menus. They call it um, zero-layer ethos, which just means, you know, not having to scroll through a lot of different layers, a lot of different menus to find what you need. So they're going to have climate control buttons, um positioned in a very easy to access location, makes sense. Um, They also said that the buttons are gonna have, are gonna be calibrated. You're gonna be able to use um, force feedback. So you could push a button harder to change the function of a control, like let's say for the fan. They didn't say this specifically, but it's an example. So if you wanted to make the fan higher, it would be like you could push the button harder or something like that. Looks really cool. They said they have built-in artificial intelligence into the screen. Um, it looks completely out of a movie. Um, never seen anything like this in another vehicle. But navigation, driver controls, the passenger side, all of this looks completely next generation. Nothing we've seen before. And it'll be exciting to see the full release of the vehicle on April 15th, twenty. 21. So that'll be a big day. Big, big day. Switching gears a bit. There was a new spider, a new, um, a new spider that was just named and it's called a peacock spider. It's a, it's a type of Australian jumping spider and they're, they're named usually because they have very, they're called peacock spiders because they have very bright, very bright, um, spots on their body they're very small spiders normally if they're not under a magnifying glass or a microscope you can't really see them they're only a couple of millimeters in length but australian arachnologist joseph schubert he named a new um one of these spiders adorable spider after finding nemo and you could see it's orange and white has green eyes it looks sort of like you know nemo from finding nemo and Right now, this is a new species of the peacock spider, and he was able to name it. Where it was found, it's, you know, found in Australia, but it was found in um, the southern region of Australia and in an area where there's no other peacock spiders known to be. This is the first species um, of the peacock spider that has been found in that location, and... um, 
I'm surprised he was able to find it because these spiders are really, really small. They, you know, they're only 1.5 millimeters to seven millimeters. But I thought this was pretty interesting. If you look at this video, um, peacock spider, it says peacock spider dancing to YMCA. But um, they have, a, you can see all of them have really bright colors. This one in particular though was just the orange and white, but the ones in the video here, some of them are purple and purple and pink some are you know green some are orange but this one is specifically orange and white new species they named it basically after finding nemo not the first time they've named it after um some sort of pop culture reference but it was pretty interesting i thought this this picture looked fake to me it looked completely photoshopped but supposedly it's not now onto some Bitcoin news. Um, Visa, Visa just took a major step towards embracing cryptocurrency, embracing Bitcoin, and taking the next step they need into um, being able to really accept Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other types of cryptocurrency. So what they did is just recently they announced that it will now allow the use of cryptocurrency, specifically USD stablecoin, USDC, to settle transactions on its payment network. And this is a really big deal. They're, they're piloting this program with crypto.com and they said they're gonna, they're planning on launching this out, rolling this out to more, um, more partners later this year. But right now, they're gonna allow transactions to be settled with um, USDC. And essentially, by doing this, this is a really big deal because it's going to remove added costs for both other companies and for Visa associated with um, added costs and complexities associated with doing business in cryptocurrency and allow crypto native partners to explore like new business models without needing to worry about traditional fiat currencies, try, you know, transferring them back and forth. They can just settle all the transactions in cryptocurrency using USDC. Um, this is a pretty big deal. It's a major milestone in my opinion. And um, being able to settle the transactions using cryptocurrency, it's going to allow for a lot of changes, um, making a major step into being able to use, being able to use cryptocurrency just in your day-to-day -day life. Um, this is the first step of many companies doing similar things. It is a pilot program with crypto.com, but they said they're gonna have plans of rolling this out to more people later in the year. So that will be, that will be good. It will be good. Next up, next up is Hyundai. They're Kona EV. Um, they're recalling more than 80,000 EVs because of battery concerns. And this has been an issue that a lot of people have been worried about for just electric vehicles in general. People have been worried about batteries, batteries catching fire, you know, charging your batteries when you're taking long trips. And this does not look good. You know, it's not a good thing for electric vehicles when we're seeing thousands of vehicles catch on fire. And so according to the US National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, they issued a recall for 2019 and 2020 Hyundai Kona and 2020 Hyundai um, Ionic electric vehicles after there have been dozens of battery fires reported. The agency, they warned about people, you know, parking these vehicles inside of their houses, inside a garage. They said the best place to keep these vehicles is gonna be as far away from your home and other structures as possible because there is a big risk. Um, Hyundai, they announced that they would recall about 76,000 vehicles last month. Um, a, a Kona EVs built between 2018 and 2020. Now they had to up that even more. So now they're gonna be recalling about 82,000 vehicles, which is totaling $900 million for the company. And this is not it's not what you want to see when there's being a big push for electric vehicles. You don't want to see having to recall so many vehicles. And it's happened not just with Hyundai, but it's happened with a lot of different car manufacturers. We've seen um, Tesla have to recall vehicles. Um, GM said it would recall nearly 69,000 Chevy Bolts. Um, Audi, they recalled 500 e-tron SUVs. Neo, 
which is a Chinese electric vehicle maker. They recalled nearly 5,000 ES8 electric SUVs. And right now it's just, it's, when there's being a big push for electric vehicles, you don't want to see that there is a lot of them having major issues because this is a major issue. This is like when, you know, Samsung phones were exploding. This is the same sort of thing. Batteries catching fire and it's become such a big issue that even even first responders have been trained to handle these EV battery fires because you can't put them out with the same traditional methods that you'd put out other fires. So there needs to be a specific approach that they use. And so, you know, this is a lot. 82,000 vehicles from... Hyundai, 69,000 Chevy Bolts, 500 Tron SUVs, 5,000 Neo vehicles, and Tesla vehicles as well. So we'll see what happens with this, but just be careful um, if you have a Hyundai Kona EV. They say keep it away from house, keep it away from large structures, and you know, you want to stay safe. Now on to Kathy Wood and Bitcoin. So Kathy Wood said $1 trillion market cap for Bitcoin is is ultimately nothing. It's it's nothing compared to where it's ultimately going to be. And right now, at current price of Bitcoin, it has a market cap, like what you could call a market cap of about $1 trillion. And ARK Invest CEO, Kathy Wood, she recently came out, she had some statements about Bitcoin. It's talking about where it would be in the future. She said it. they believe it could easily reach $400,000 per coin within the next couple of years. And speaking on a on an investment panel, she said that if we add all of the potential demand relative to the limited supply, because Bitcoin has a limited supply, there's only going to be 22 million Bitcoin ever in existence, ever be mined. And if you take that into account, then you're going to start to see big numbers very, very quickly. And she says that they've just started to begin. Um, One trillion dollars is nothing compared to where it ultimately will be. And she explained how she thinks large corporations are going to start to allocate about one, um, about a single digit percentage of their balance sheet to Bitcoin. And that's a pretty big deal. She says that um, if institutions, they start to do that, that this is going to be a way to minimize volatility, maximize their sharp ratio, and they should put something between two and a half percent and six and a half percent of the cash in their portfolio in Bitcoin. So, We'll wait and see what happens, but this is a pretty big deal. Um, Bitcoin, Kathy Woods predicting will be at $400,000 within the next couple of years. This is very possible if institutions continue to allocate money into it, and if we see them all allocate about 2 to 6% of their balance other cash balance into Bitcoin. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. Next up is Apple. Apple, there's some rumors that they can reportedly get a very a rugged model for extreme sports that can, that's going to be rubberized. And right now, Apple's, their Apple Watch, they don't have any model that's specifically, you know, really designed for extreme sports, um, a lot of outside activity because they have stainless steel or some sort of metal, um, metal watch, metal compartment that the watch is in. And... Right now, they're saying they're calling this the Explorer Edition. Um, it's still a rumor, so but they're calling this the Explorer Edition inside of Apple. And this rugged variant of the Apple Watch is going to be similar to the one seen on the Casio G-Shock models, according to Bloomberg. It's going to have impact-resistant casing. It's going to be rubberized. And they're also support reportedly in talks of putting new software in it for swimming and tracking that as well. So this will be a pretty big deal. A lot of people like Apple Watches. A lot of people use these when they exercise all during the day. And for people who are more active, having something that's rubberized, while it's going to you know change the look completely, it would be much better. You're not going to worry about it getting scratched or falling or anything like that because it would have this rubberized casing. And that would be, me personally, I would like to have a rubberized casing instead of just the metal casing they currently have, whether that's, you know, stainless steel, aluminum. Better to have, in my opinion, some sort of rugged casing, especially if you're gonna use this for like swimming and and a lot of outdoor activities. It depends on what you're using it for, but 
we'll see what happens here. Um, Apple, they are the leader in in global wearable shipments. Q4 of 2020, they had about 36.2% of all of those shipments. And we'll wait and see what happens. It's reportedly, it's reportedly called Explorer Edition inside of Apple. And this is going to be like a rubberized casing um, for extreme sports. Um, just a more rugged model. Here, here's a story. Uh, Indonesian Indonesian oil refinery ignites into towering inferno. There was a big fire in one of the Indonesian um, oil refineries, creating like hundreds of people to have to evacuate from where they live. Um, a lot of people were injured. Um, no deaths um, tied immediately to this. They say at least 20 people have been injured, five of whom are in intensive care with severe burns, and 950 local residents have been evacuated from their homes. Um, but they said that no one has died specifically related to this. There's been someone who's had a heart attack in the niece, in the area. But essentially what happened is the fire began at in the middle of the night, and it was raining, and what they believe happened was this oil refinery there's 72 gasoline storage units four of them caught on fire they believed that there was a leak in one that they were repairing and while they were repairing the leak it was raining and there was lightning they believe that lightning struck some of you know it struck the facility the refinery and it caught on fire so they think that is how the fire started was because of lightning igniting you know the oil it struck one of the uh, either one of the units or struck where they were working on it, fixing the leak, and that is how it started. According to reports, they said there was a lot of people in this local areas. They said that they could smell, that they could smell the the leak, and they believe that's how it happened because they said it was raining and there was lightning while it happened. So hopefully everyone is okay. This doesn't look good at all. Um, they said the fires have been going on for days now. Um, a lot of black smoke, you know, oil refinery, so it makes sense. Luckily, it wasn't the whole entire facility. It was only four out of the 72 units. But we'll have to wait and see what happens here. Hopefully, no one, no one, everyone ends up being okay. The oil refinery can get back up and running and everything is good. Speaking of factories, though, having issues. Earlier in the year, um, a Renzus owned chip plant in Northeast Japan. They were hit by a fire earlier in the month and the company said it would take at least a month to resume production. And this is a big deal because this is um, semiconductor chips. There's been a you know worldwide shortage of these. And now they're saying that the damage from the fire in this factory could be a lot worse than people thought. So, Renzus Electronics Corp, they now believe damage from its fire were more extensive than first thought. Initially, they thought it was 11 machines that were damaged, but now they're thinking around 17 machines were damaged. And the problem with this is that, first of all, this affects all the electric vehicle makers. It affects, you know, all electronic components. But the problem with this is that originally they said that they would be able to get back up and running fairly quickly, you know, in about a month. But... Replacing damaged machines could take several months. So even though they may get back up and running, now it's almost double as many machines as they thought are going to be damaged. And though that you know that's it takes a lot longer to replace the machines they said than to just get back up and running. So that's a big deal. And this company accounts for 30% of the global market for micro microcontroller units used in cars and two thirds of the chips produced at the facility are for the auto industry. This is not good because a lot of electric vehicle companies have been already struggling with this. They've had this chip shortage has been affecting all of them. It's affected Ford, GM, um, affected even Tesla. And that brings us to NIO because NIO, Chinese electric vehicle company had to shut down production for five entire days at its facility due to a chip shortage. This is causing their Q1 estimates of total vehicles delivered in Q1 to drop from 20,500 20, vehicles to 19,500. So they're dropping their, their estimates by 1,000. And this is a big deal. Having to shut down production for five days because of you know semiconductors and chips, that's, that's not what you want to have happen. 
you don't want to have just something simple like you know these chips be but hold back production and you know delay production but this is something we're seeing pretty common across the auto industry um general motors Volkswagen, Honda, Ford, all of these companies have been caught off guard by the chip shortage. A lot of this caused by the Renzus, you know, factory in Japan that caught on fire. And now that that was worse than people expected, the fire in that factory was worse than people expected. That's going to mean that now, you know, they could see even bigger delays. Things could take even longer. So this isn't just for NEO. Um, while it is NEO, you know, that had to shut down their factory for five days. All car companies are struggling as a result of this because that one facility made a majority of the market share of chips for the auto industry. So I have to wait and see what happens. But Ford, they said that this could hit their profit by up to $2.5 billion in 2021. GM expects um, the crisis could shave up to $2 billion from its full year profit. So that's a lot of money we're talking. You know, $2 billion GM, $2.5 billion Ford. This is money they're losing because of this chip shortage. And same with, you know, Neo. Even though they're a much smaller company, they're just getting off the ground. They're in their startup and they're really needing to grow and build. And this is not something, you know, obviously you have to expect these challenges to come in, but not something you want to see. It's not, you know, the best of signs for the auto industry, especially with this chip shortage happening at the factory that makes most of the chips for the auto industry. Speaking of electric vehicles though, power sports company, BRP, they're gonna be making an electric watercraft, go-kart, motorcycle, and other vehicles. And this is really exciting. These vehicles look really cool. So the Canadian sports, um, power sports firm, BRP announced just announced that they're going to spend $300 million to electrify its entire lineup of vehicles by 2026. And the company, they currently manufacture, you know, watercrafts, snowmobiles, ATVs, go-karts. Um, they said that they're going to be rolling out the production of their electric vehicle lineup within the next two years. And that's very exciting. There are $13 billion um Global Power Sports, the $13 billion global power sports market is slowly starting to move into electric vehicles, um, you know, electrify their drivetrains. And BRP is one of the big players. They own brands like Ski Do for snowmobiles, Ski, um, Ski Do Watercraft, Riker ATVs, Rotax Go Karts. And they're trying to position themselves ahead, get ahead in this movement to electric, electric vehicles. And according to their CEO, um, CEO of BRP, he said that we've always known that electrification um, was going to happen. It wasn't a question. It was just more a matter of when it was going to happen, not if it was going to happen. So now they are spending $300 million into investing into Electrified's entire lineup. Um, this isn't the first time they're producing an electric vehicle. 2019, the company did acquire Alta Motors, which is an electric um, motorcycle manufacturer. They introduced their first EV, the Rotax Sonic e-cart, and they're going to be using a similar drivetrain that's in those vehicles in their other, their, their, the rest of their EV lineup. So it'll be interesting to see how these come out. Pictures look pretty cool. Um, you know, they just look very similar to what they already are at, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. It's good to see other companies, not just, um, car companies moving into the electric vehicle space. Switching gears, Lil Nas X, um, he came out with a, he had a collaboration with a shoe company with MSCHF and they produced a new shoe called the Satan Shoes and they quickly sold out. They reported that they sold out within less than one minute of dropping. It was a limited quantity. They sold for about well, like $1,000, around $1,000 for the sneakers and Right now, apparently they were modified Nike shoes and Nike's not happy about this because these shoes, according to the company, they were called, you know, dubbed the Satan shoes and they contain a drop of human blood drawn from MSCHF employees in every, you know, shoe. 
a drop of human blood. And Nike was not a big fan of this. So Nike, Nike sues MSCHF over these controversial Satan shoes that contain human blood. So even though they said that they never approved of this. So these are, you know, modified Nike shoes, modified Nike Air Max 97s. Um, but even though, because because they're using Nike shoes and they're customizing them for this collaboration with Lil Nas X, Nike was not happy. And they're suing. They're suing them. Um, we don't know the specific details of it yet, but there were 666 pairs of shoes that were released in this collaboration with Lil Nas X, sold out in less than a minute. And there's been a lot of confusion about Nike's connection with this. A lot of people think, you know, Nike is approved of this. Nike, these are Nike shoes. They must be done with Nike. But no, this really had nothing to do with Nike. They were just customized Nike shoes. And so with that being said, um, a lot of people, there's been a lot of confusion about what exactly is going on between Nike and this specific shoe. A lot of people came out and said, you know, like Saint, which is a pretty popular, pretty popular shoe, shoe person, shoe com, a shoe influencer. They tweeted, um, you know, Nike Air Max 97s contain 60 cc ink, one drop of human blood, 666 pairs, sells for $1,018. So the first thing they said was Nike Air Max 97. And because of that, people think that this was done almost, you know, as part of Nike. But no, Nike had nothing to do with this. They're not happy at all. They've been getting a lot of backlash because of it. So they are suing MSCHF. A lot of people are worried. Are they going to get their shoes? Are they not going to get the shoes? What's going to happen now? Because people already spent the money. People already spent $1,000 on it. So they want to know what is going to happen now. Are they going to get their money back? Are they still going to get the shoes? What is going to happen? But I'll keep you updated on the developments here. Either way, what we do know is that Nike is not happy at all and they are suing MSCHF over these, you know, Satan shoes. So keep you updated on that. But that's all I got for you guys today. Um, covered a lot of different stories. But I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. And if you made it this far, comment down below sneaker emojis so I know you guys made it this far. But I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to get your four free stocks by up to $1,600 when you download the Weeble investing app using the link down below. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.